All right, this is The Case Against Socialism by Rand Paul. We're going to take a look at the book. Links in the description. So I pre-read the first chart. Before that, starting at the beginning, dedication for Kelly. I don't know who Kelly is. Doesn't tell me who Kelly is. Then there's the poem. I don't care about the poem. Why is this a I think that they should put dedications like the end of the book and don't put it in the way of the poem and just put it after. So there's a lot of like introductory stuff people put at the beginning of the book, like about the author kind of stuff, like their story of writing. They should just put that at the end. Like after you've read the book, you might care about the author. Before you've read the book, you don't care. Anyways, so table of contents. So a lot of chapters. Even the shorter side. Individually. That's probably a good thing. The book is broken up. Section. I read the first paragraph already. I really did not like it from a writing perspective. One of my questions for the book is how ghost written it. Like there's a there's a certain standard <coughs> standard style that books have where I suspect they might have written a fair amount. Uh, so I, I don't know about that. That's just something I was wondering about. I was looking at the writing style and you read the first sentence. It was one of those long-winded speeches in front of thousands of stepping soldiers that seemed to be a performance in a libertarian regime. That is style. Very normal. It is something a ghostwriter could have written or that an editor could have written. It's not like an intellectual popular main. Other thing about it is that it says was. It's it's a little like of a long winded, a little awkward. But anyways, it says was. Then I start reading the next sentence. It says the parade stands. Like what the hell stand? Hard to hear me. Keep um. Hold on. Wait, where's my AT twenty? To unplug it, I got test. Test. Okay, I think it's using the correct mic now. That's weird. The uh... oh, that's too high. I like right here. Okay, the light was on, but the computer stopped picking up the mic. But the light was still on, so it was plugged in and getting power. But it was no longer working. So replugging it in now, it, my mic works. Okay, well, to summarize what I said, there's a dedication at the beginning. doesn't need to be there. And the first sentence is the kind of thing a ghostwriter could write or an editor could suggest. It's a little long-winded. It's not very intellectual. It's sort of, like, assuming... It's, it's condescending in a way. It assumes that readers, like, just get bored really easily and you need to paint pictures for them. You can't just talk about ideas. And that they want like scenes in physical reality rather than explanations of abstract concepts. So it's trying to concretize things. But anyways, that's just the first sentence. But what I notice is it says was. So we're, we're past tense, which is fine. 
But then I read the parade stands. I'm like, stands is present tense, so that's weird. And also, it didn't mention a parade in the previous sentence. It's sort of implied, like you could call the soldiers a parade, but it's weird to refer to the parade after saying goose-stepping soldiers. Like, that would be bad writing. But then what I figured out is that the sentence, stands is not a verb, stands is a noun. Parade is not a noun, it is an adjective. They mean parade stands, like as a thing. But when you read the parade stands along, it sounds like stands is a verb. And you have to get to here, this R over here, before you find out that stands was not a verb. So the, the sentence is terrible because it's really easy to read it one way, and then later you find out there's a different verb and you have to reread uh, and revise your reading of the previous part of the sentence. You have to go back and be like, oh, that wasn't a verb after all, even though it looked like one. So anytime you have to go back because you were misled about how the sentence was developing, that's really bad. And this is the first paragraph of the book, and that's that's an area where they heavily edit, so it shouldn't be so bad. That's like that's fucked up that they're making this major editing error in the first paragraph of the book. And it's a two sentence paragraph and they get it wrong. And not just in that way, but in two ways. The second way it's wrong is we have was and then we have are. Um, so these are not the same tense. Was, are, past, present. Like what the fuck are they doing? I, I get why they want to use present tense. They're trying to draw the reader into it. Yes, this is the Rand Paul book, in case you missed it, The Case Against Socialism. So present tense makes sense for their purpose of drawing the reader into it. So we have like, as President Maduro steps the podium, blah, blah, blah. This stuff is happening. They, they tell it like it's happening in real time. These drones are typically used. The drones speeding towards carry. You know, present tense makes sense. But then they, they just started with it was, instead of it is. They just can't keep their tenses straight. It's, it's really odd. I think it's because individually they wanted to say was in the sentence. It sounds right to them. Like, it was one of those long-winded speeches. They're like, it sounds like the right way of setting the scene. It's sort of cliche. If you say it's one of those long-winded speeches. Um, it doesn't quite fit the cliche quite as well. So I think they just went with the cliche and never really noticed the tense mismatch or decided to ignore it. So yeah, not an intellectual book. That's what I'm thinking. Anyway, so the case against socialism is going to begin with the speech. And there's a drone. Oh yeah, I read, well, I skimmed the first three paragraphs earlier today. And I saw this right here, this word assassination. So there's a there's a speech going on, and there's some drones coming with explosives. Um, and it says, while they are not military drones, their intent is the same, assassination. Now, this is a complete and utter slander against militaries. Militaries are not in the assassination business. The intention of militaries in general is not assassination. Now, there's the occasional exception, but normally what military drones are used for is killing people, and killing people is not the same thing as assassination. Assassination is like covert, sneaky, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it is a different thing than, you know, fighting. It's like the difference between killing and murder. It's, it's a similar kind of thing. Like, an assassination implies basically murder. Assassination sounds like worse than murder. Whereas what the military does is like less bad than murder. Like you can you can complain about the horrors of war, and there there are many. But uh, it's not the same as murderers. Like they're doing it for a reason. There's some sort of legitimacy to it. People vote for it. Whatever. Like, it's murderers are like these chaotic things destroying society. They're really bad. They're kind of random. Um, war is a organized societal activity on purpose. There's a lot to dislike about it, but you really should be differentiating it from assassination. And, you know, this is an American book, American author. And in my understanding, the general U.S. policy is not to assassinate political leaders at all, let alone while they're making speeches. 
I don't think we've like strictly upheld that in our history, but I think that that is something of a general policy that most countries generally go with because uh, it is in the mutual interest of all the leaders not to be assassinating each other because they don't want to be assassinated. That's my rough understanding. Which makes reasonable sense, but is more reason not to call our military drones assassination drones. And in, in this particular case, they are not military drones. So the military was not the one doing the assassination. But he just mirrors the military for some reason. The speech plods on. Yes, assassination is a negative word that he's using on purpose to make it sound like really bad. There's such thing as a just war. There, I think there's also such thing as a legitimate or justified assassination, but that's like more sketchy, like less well known, more controversial. Uh, so I'm. My plan is to, ooh, Trump. I was going to skim for interesting stuff. I don't think this book's important, and I mostly wanted to read about economics and, and see what it says about, like, Mises and Riesman and stuff. Sanders does not know what freedom is. This is not an intellectual rebuttal. Like, Sanders hasn't noticed food and medicine not available in Venezuela. Not getting into, like, economic theory. This is the kind of bickering that isn't all that effective because the other side does have bickering level retorts. They can make quips and one-liners of this quality against us. Like, if you just assume you get to say a sentence to, like, attack someone and they don't get to respond, they can attack us too and look about as good in the eyes of the man on the street. We don't have some sort of decisive advantage at one-line quips about how stupid the other side is. They can make fun of us too, so this is a bad sort of... It's bad to roll around in the mud with them. They're just as good at mud wrestling as we are, our advantage is in you know, scholarly theory. Not just scholarly theory, like practical results too, like you know, stock markets up. I don't know how much that has to do with Trump really, but I think some. Well, it is different because he doesn't actually want to expropriate the appro expropriators. He does not actually want to seize all industry, all capital goods, all factories at gunpoint and collectivize and take government ownership of all of them. Uh, he does not want to murder all the current factory owners or a large number of them or jail or whatever because they would actually resist and they have guns and so on. Um, but it is different than socialism. I think this is a major point of Riesman. Riesman was uh, happy that his name was mentioned in the book a bunch of times. However, this comment shows that Rand Paul is not listening to Riesman. This is absolutely contrary to Riesman's standard line about socialism. He says Bernie Sanders to his credit, is not enough of a thug and murderer to actually advocate socialism. What he wants is something different, and he should stop calling it socialism. That is Riesman's repeated line. Take a look on Twitter. I think this should be defined. From Sanders. Search that right? Okay, so we need to search for socialism as well. He's covered this stuff in uh, in books as well. He 
See, look, democratic socialism is essentially capitalism with a conscience. Riesman's comment, Lysander sign below, is an admission of total defeat for socialism. It says that socialism is now capitalism. It's the exact, it's exact and hated opposite. It's equivalent to saying democratic Nazism is essentially Judaism, but with bacon and pepperoni pizza. All right, now here's the type of thing I was talking about. Socialism means government ownership of the means of production. Sanders says he doesn't want this, so why does he call himself a socialist? Questions for Senator Sanders and as follows. Are you in fact a socialist? If so, how would you avoid the massive armed robbery and accompanying murders that would be required to establish, to actually establish socialism? Or would you sanction them? And the short answer is that Bernie Sanders does not want to murder that many people. I mean, he's confused intellectually. His views are not totally consistent, but basically he doesn't want to kill millions of people. Now, I don't like the guy, but I think I can say that much. Here we go. So from Riesman's book, Marxism slash Socialism, this is a longer title, but whatever. Consistent with the laws of logic, the social democrats need to stop calling themselves socialists and to insist that no one else call them socialists. This is because the word socialist means one who advocates socialism. And as much as socialism means government ownership of the means of production, the word socialist logically implies that one is an advocate of government ownership of the means of production, which... In the real world of choosing and acting, the social democrats, democrats, to their credit, have repeatedly shown that they are not. So they give um, aid and comfort to a philosophy responsible for untold human misery and the deaths of tens of millions of innocent people, but they don't actually want to do that themselves. See, it's... The whole section is important. The social democrats should stop calling themselves socialists. The need to use armed force to establish socialism has created a major split in the socialist movement. The split is between the communists, who are the true socialists, and the social democrats. The social democrats talk about establishing socialism and describe themselves as socialists, but have managed to retain enough moral sense to want to avoid mass bloodshed. As a result, they effectively abandon socialism as their actual goal. When they come to power, social democrats retain capitalism as the economic system. They just hamper it with additional taxes and regulations, such as Sweden, Norway, and France, which are capitalist countries with uh, too much regulation, too much government interference, etc. You could call it a mixed economy, but it's not a socialist country because the, the primary system is capitalism. They have a market. The means of production in those countries, like Sweden, Norway, and France, is primarily owned by private individuals, not the government. And to a similar amount as the U.S., not like way more government ownership of this. Anyway, so this is what Riesman says. This is the book by Rand Paul, which has Riesman's name in it. Uh, approximately 34 times. And here we are near the beginning. And he just, he does not know Riesman's basic positions about socialism. And he's writing the case against socialism and he's citing Riesman. He is just ignorant of what Riesman's views on socialism are. And on democratic socialism in particular. So here, Sanders' socialism will make the world, quote, fair, unquote. Rand Paul is calling Sanders a socialist and attributing Sanders' position, uh, calling it socialism, saying it is socialism. President Trump is right to be concerned about socialism coming to America. 
So he just does not agree with Riesman. Has no counter arguments against Riesman. I would bet money. Uh, and is just ignorant of Riesman. That's what I think is going on here. Riesman, however, does not call him out on this. Instead, Riesman tweets about how many times his name was mentioned. He ought to know better. He ought to be extremely skeptical. Extremely skeptical of this book. Like before reading it, he should doubt it's good and be prepared to intellectually combat it and, and say what's wrong with it and what's the wrong approach and so on. Uh, he shouldn't be expecting it to actually agree with him. Okay, so chapter one on the case against socialism is not about basic economics. It is about Venezuela. So like that, let's go back to the table of contents and see what we want to read. Socialism rewards corruption. Interfering with free markets causes shortages. Okay, now that one sounds better. Capitalism is the more moral system. All right, we're going to take a look at chapters three and four. Maybe we'll have something. Right, Chavez and Modero. Price controls. They had price controls, then there were shortages. This is a correlation equal causation type argument. First one thing, then something else happened. So we're going to say that the one thing caused the other thing. This is not a convincing argument. Frequently, one thing happens, and then something unrelated happens. That's also a thing that's common. Now, as you read Riesman's book, um, his Capitalism, a Treatise on Economics, you'll find out why socialism causes short. And in particular, price control. Okay, so Rand Paul says a fundamental law of economics is that if governments set a price of a good below the market price, there will be shortages and a thriving black market. Okay, this is not, in fact, a fundamental law of economics. Uh, if he had stopped here, it would have been okay. It would have just been an assertion without argument, um, completely out of the blue, just asserting it. But he didn't stop here. He said, and a thriving black market. It is not a fundamental law of economics that government's price controls cause thriving black markets. Um, they do not necessarily cause that. You can have price controls without a thriving black market. How do you do that? Well, you turn one in three members of your society into an informant. You spend a large, large budget on secret police. And if you do it well enough, and if you stomp on people enough, you won't have a thriving black market. That's completely possible. It's hard, but it's within possibility. And you know, the, law, the fundamental laws of economics are about what must be the case, what's logically necessary, stuff like that. They're not these things of exception. If it's like, well, if you're oppressive enough, you can stop it, that's not a fundamental law of economics. Okay, so price ceilings cause shortages. <laughs> is he going to say why they cause shortages? That's what I'm looking for right now. I'm just skimming to try to see if he says why. Give any reasoning, any argument, or does he just asserting it? So here, what he's doing is appealing to authority. Rutgers professor Hugh Rockoff explains that the vast majority of economists are generally opposed to price control. Okay, so here, he's appealing to the authority of one Rutgers, two professors, and three Hugh Rockoff in particular to appeal to the authority of the vast majority of economists. This is just the same quality of argument as when they say global warming is real because the vast majority of scientists think so. But it's worse than that. It would be like global warming is real because this particular science from this particular university with a prestigious name said that most scientists think it's real. And then it gets worse. He paraphrases Milton Friedman to show the havoc price controls rake. So now we have him, you know, stacked on top of these appeals to authority where now he's paraphrasing Milton Friedman. So we have Rand Paul referring to Hugh Rockoff to get authority. 
And he rock off refers to Milton Friedman to get authority. And none of this is actually arguments. And what does Friedman say? Economists may not know much, but they do know how to produce a shortage or surplus. I think this might be part of the quote, but it's hard to tell. I'm going to need to open this in a different... Uh... In iBooks, so I can see what's going on better. Oh, so we were in chapter three. Okay, here we go. We can see what's a block quote now. Who used Reagan as appeal to authority a lot? I mean, I think a lot of them did. But I, I can't tell who you mean. But I think that was particularly common among the Republican candidates, is to say Reagan stuff. Right, so the text is pretty small for the block quote. Let me make that a bit bigger. All right, anyway. So we're still quoting Milton Friedman. Price ceilings which prevent prices from exceeding cost shortages. Price floors cause surpluses, at least for a time. Suppose that the supply and demand for wheat and flour are balanced. This does not explain why, this is just asserting it. So all this appeals to authority and then all he does is assert the conclusion. He's not explaining it so you can understand for yourself why it's true. There's like the tiniest bit of explanation here, but it's not enough to teach someone who doesn't already know it. Then what does Rand Paul do? Even in the United States, we have not been immune to the economic foolishness of price controls. Well, Milton Friedman was paraphrased by Hugh Rockoff saying it, so it must be true that we can now conclude price controls are economic foolishness and move on. He's not trying to educate you. He's not trying to help you understand for yourself what's wrong with price control. He's just telling you famous people said it. It's a terrible method. Famous people said socialism is wonderful. Um, there are people on the other side with authority, with prestige, with public reputation, fame, etc. So playing the game of <coughs> which side has more fame, let's assume they're right. It's it's completely biased and it's all about double standards because, you know, he's just picking, he's cherry picking which famous people he wants to agree with. And the other side can play that game too. And it has nothing to do with what's true. And it has nothing to do with educating people. All right, so now we have Riesman coming up, apparently. So when he says something like, Riesman does a great job of arguing that, what he's doing is he's saying, I am competent to judge Riesman. Riesman is an economist, an authority, and I, Rand Paul, am in a position to pronounce judgment on Riesman. He's trying to elevate himself as a super authority over Riesman's authority. He's also trying to, by praising Riesman, say whatever Riesman says must be true because it was a great job. It's just, you know, complete assertion. He does not argue that Riesman did a great job. He just asserts it and expects us to take his word for it. All right, now, according to Rand Paul, man has a natural impulse to self-interest and self-preservation, which always leads to a black market. Now, is that what Riesman said? Let's, let's take a quick look. I'm just going to take this phrase, natural impulse, and see if Riesman ever said that in his book. 
Oh, it's not in this book. Let's try Capitalism, a Treatise on Economics. All right, here we go. We have this very much longer book. The Riesman, in his whole treatise, say the phrase natural impulse. Zero hits. Oh no, Rand Paul is a fraud. All right, let's just try natural. See how many hits there are. 321. Oh, there's a lot. Natural resource. All right, let's try impulse. There are two hits for impulse, so I'm going to look at those in a sec, but let's try this other book. Natural, nine hits for natural, impulse. Zero for impulse. All right. So we'll look at the nine hits for natural in this book and the two hits for impulse in the treatise. Impulse. All right. Notwithstanding the tendency of wages to conform to their natural rate, their market rate may, in an improving society, for an indefinite period, be constantly above it, for no sooner may the impulse which an increased capital gives to a new demand for labor be obeyed. Okay, this is not talking about the same sort of thing like man's natural impulses to self interest and self preservation. This is not a statement about human nature, this is a statement about economics. Not the same sort of use of the word. Here, capital has one single life impulse the tendency to create value capital is dead labor that vampire like only lives by sucking living labor and the lives the more the more labor it sucks oh this is marx marx writes okay i was wondering I, this i was i found this weird and i was wondering if it was a quote <laughs> okay so the second use of impulse is a quote from marx so half the time that Riesman uses the word impulse which is twice in two books, it's actually just quoting Marx. But again, it is not man has impulses or man has a human nature or whatever, it is capital does. But it's still different, but it's also Marx. Wait, this one is also not Riesman. Look, Ricardo had some serious reservations. Just a few paragraphs later, he writes. So this one was a quote of Ricardo, and this one was a quote of Marx. So Riesman himself used the word impulse zero times. Literally zero times. Not just no natural impulse, no impulse. Now, I was suspicious of this because it didn't sound like a very objectivist attitude, and Riesman's an objectivist. So anyways, uh, Rand Paul is incorrectly paraphrasing Riesman. Riesman was happy to see his name in print, but did not complain that his views were misstated. All right, so this one I was going to just look at the natural and see what he says. Naturally and rightfully wage. Okay, not related usage. Not right. Okay, so none of this was about human nature or what humans naturally do. Look, it's Riesman, Riesman, Riesman. And as Riesman concludes, and right in the fucking middle of this, we have because man's natural self impulse to self interest. Calling self interest a fucking impulse is an insult to self interest. Let's look up the word impulse. The influence of a particular feeling, mental state, etc. So in other words, it's like emotionalism. Sudden involuntary inclination prompting to action. Yes, impulses are sudden and involuntary. So self-interest is not a you know well-considered long-run self-interested policy that is intelligent and provides for a harmonious society and so on or is, you know, necessary to your life, or anything like that, is a sudden involuntary inclination, which makes you act. That is the kind of thing Rand Paul is not only saying, which would be bad enough, but putting those fucking words in George Riesman's mouth, who's better than that?
a mental force which simply and directly urges to action, hasty inclination, sudden motive, momentary or transient influence, or of appetite or passion, propension incitement, as a man of good employment. So this is not at all what self-interest is in the objectivist view. This is not what Reisman's view is. A sudden spontaneous inclination or an incitement of the mind or spirit arising either directly from feeling or from some outer influence. So it has to come from feeling or outer influence in this definition and prompting some usually unpremeditated action. This is so far from how you should think about self-interest, which is a, you know, rational, reasonable, long-term view. A sudden, strong, and unreflective urge or desire to act. So unreflective, you don't think about it. These definitions all seem fine to me, by the way. They, they fit, like, my understanding of the word. I think it's a very standard, well-known word. Um... Force or influence exerted upon the mind by some external stimulus, suggestion, incitement, instigation. A strong suggestion supposed to come from a good or evil spirit. This is the Oxford English Dictionary. Incitement or stimulus to action arising from some state of mind or feeling, sudden or involuntary inclination or tendency to act without premeditation or reflection. Yeah, so this is a slander against self-interest. Okay, so after he quotes this Riesman stuff, and misparaphrases and whatever, the next fucking thing he says, some will argue that that's far-fetched. As in, it is completely natural if your reaction to Riesman is to think Riesman is far-fetched. That is what Rand Paul says next. And then the next thing he says is, certainly, price controls don't always lead to totalitarianism. So, you'll think Riesman is far-fetched, and certainly he's kind of sort of wrong sometimes. But, like, he's throwing Riesman under the bus here. He's like, here's the extremist. I'm not an extremist. I'm not crazy like that. But you have to admit he's half right. You know, the golden mean. Yet, even in America, punitive cigarette taxes created a black market in loose cigarettes in New York, which resulted in tragic extrajudicial violence. So, although his, his concepts and principles seem far-fetched, and in practice he's wrong sometimes, in practice, in concrete instances, sometimes it turns out kind of like that. This is such a fucking stretch, though. Resulted in tragic extrajudicial violence. Like, he just doesn't have a good case here. This doesn't sound very much like totalitarianism. He's trying to phrase what happened without telling us what it is to make it sound similar to totalitarianism. Tragic extrajudicial violence. That doesn't sound like totalitarianism. All right, what is it? The state in the form of at least one police officer. Okay, so it resulted in totalitarianism in the form of at least one police officer. That's not totalitarianism. That, that's a different thing. That is not, a, you know, a secret police and a Gestapo stomping down on the black market. And delivered a deadly chokehold to Eric Garner, who on the day of his murder didn't even happen to be in possession of any loose cigarette. Okay, first of all, I've read about this thing before, and the guy was like a repeat criminal and blah blah blah. Like, there's, there's another side to this story. Like, as a right-wing person who's not, you know, a huge friend of the police and the government, um, I do not think this is a fair telling of the story, from what I remember. But anyways, this is the best he can do. Riesman's theories may seem far-fetched, and in practice he's wrong sometimes, but if we really stretch the facts, we could say that Eric Gartner, Garner being choked by one police officer in New York was related to price controls, and that shows that there's some totalitarianism, even in America, just like Riesman said, so he's half right. Like, this is such a terrible argument, and it completely 
you know, trashes reason and loses the power of his actual reasoning. So this book is terrible and it betrays reason. Let's search for Mises now. Decades before the income inequality debate came into vogue, the great Austrian economist and writer Ludwig von Mises wrote, those who advocate equality of income distribution overlook the most important point, namely, the total available for distribution, the annual product of social labor, is not independent of the manner in which it is divided. So not independent, he means dependent. He means the manner in which you divide up all the money and wealth and whatever affects how much total you get. The fact that the product today is as great as it is not a natural or technological phenomenon independent of all social conditions, but entirely a result of our social He's saying we have a large pie because of our freedom and our profit motive and incentive and so on and private property. Mises' point is exactly what the left never gets, namely that wealth creation is not accidental, nor is it a guaranteed result. Wealth creation is dependent on an economic system. Capitalism creates wealth, socialism. So far, this is much better treatment than Riesman got. Mises goes on to explain that the incentive of unequal returns is absolutely a necessary component of a successful economic system. Mises writes, only because inequality of wealth is possible in our social order, only because it simulates everyone to produce as much as he can and at the lowest cost, mankind today have at its disposal so much wealth. If government destroys this incentive, it also destroys productivity. Individuals on average are poorer when you get rid of income inequality and their, the incentives of income. And then Rand Paul just changes the subject. Now we're, instead of citing Mises, we're citing Andy Hudzer. If you're a greedy capitalist economy, oh, if you're in a capitalist economy, greed was on the previous line. If you're in a capitalist economy, the only way you can exceed is by meeting the needs of your of other people. Um, sort of, I guess. Like that's just it's not like really an economic statement. Like why is that thrown in right after Mises? Why does he just switch to it? Then what do we have next? It's Gates, Bill Gates. Then we have Frederick Hayek. He just keeps switching to different people over and over. Homer Lucky, a friend of mine. He just wants to cite as many authorities as he can and say how many prestigious people agree with him. That seems to be his goal here. But this is not like a serious economics book at all. He's not trying to educate people actually so they'll understand economics themselves. He's just trying to say there's a lot of social status on the side of capitalism, which is a terrible thing to argue. And it's a battle we might well lose. Maybe there's more social status on the side of socialism. And it's it's not truth-seeking. The, the truth doesn't depend on which side has more famous names that agree with it. I'm reading these, like, late titles. It looks like he never has, like, the economic section. He never gets to it. It's all just pop crap. There's a lot of notes, but they're, um, the notes are just site after site with no, like, explanation. They're not footnotes with, like, details of, you know, here's a careful argument. They're just, uh, here's a source, here's a source, here's a source. So they, that's not the worst thing, but it doesn't solve the problem. And also, he keeps having URLs with periods after them with, like, no space in between. I, I do not like this format because if you copy-paste this, you know, it's not going to work. You have to like carefully avoid the period, which is part of the same word. See, word. Um, I don't think you should put punctuation that's not part of a URL, like adjacent to the URL. But that that's just a minor thing. Like he just loves to cite as many people as possible. Jason Pye and Daniel Savakas. Savakas. In an article for Federalist. They called... Cortez, a intimidator. Oh, well, if if they trash talked her, then it must be true because they wrote a Federalist article. Like it just appeals to authority. It's not socialism without purges. Well, is Bernie Sanders actually planning a purge? Like we talked about this earlier. Uh, Riesman has explained there's a major split in the party because a lot of the socialists don't want to do purges. So, e.g. When the left came to power in France and Norway, they did not, in fact, do massive purges and, like, kill all the right-wingers or something.
And he, he quotes people like Friedman and Hayek. Now, I want you to know Riesman's actual opinion of Friedman, Hayek, Rothbard. Beginning. Largely thanks, this is Riesman in his Capitalism, a Treatise on Economics. Largely thanks to von Mises, there have been other important recent or contemporary advocates of capitalism. F.A. Hayek and Milton Friedman are the two leading examples, but in my judgment, neither they nor anyone else begins to compare to von Mises in logical consistency and intellectual breadth and depth in his defense of capitalism. Hayek, for example, finds, quote, a comprehensive system of social insurance, unquote, to be consistent with capitalism. Friedman believes that fiat money is consistent with capitalism. Other lesser defenders of capitalism have even more serious inconsistencies. And then he goes after the so-called supply-siders. Then he says, much worse, Rothbard, who is widely regarded as the intellectual leader of the younger generation of the Austrian school and the Libertarian Party as well, was a self-professed anarchist and believed that the United States was the aggressor against Soviet Russia in the so-called Cold War. Now, this is such a fucking shocking statement that I checked the citation. To, to see that, you know, reason wasn't making this up or bullshitting. By way of contrast, <coughs> Henry Hazlitt, a brilliant economist and journalist, had the great merit of providing what are unquestionably the best introductions to the ideas of von Mises and the classical economists that exist. Uh, I agree, Hazlitt's wonderful. He has some really good bugs. And he's generally more introductory and easier. Mises has shorter and more introductory books, too, and then, like, also the really long ones, and then most of Hazlitt's, like, a bit on the easier side, but not easy, necessarily. Like, he has a, he has a quite long book about uh, Keynes, where he goes through the general treatise, like, chapter by chapter, uh, quote after quote, and says what's wrong with it, uh, a lot like a very, very long FI post, you know, going piece by piece and actually responding to the text with quotes. It's wonderful, but it's not introductory. But I think Hazlitt's a little underestimated. Anyways, so this is what Riesman says, you know, the, the Hayek, Friedman, Rothbard, Mundell, Laffer, Wanniski, uh, not good enough. Mises and Hazlitt and Rand are good. That is what Riesman says. And what does Rand Paul do? He quotes Riesman right next to Hayek and Friedman. He just doesn't care. He's quoting people who disagree with each other, who are inconsistent with each other. He's quoting these incompatible authorities and saying, ah, they're both on our side. Even though they're not compatible with each other, he just ignores that and says, ah, they're both anti-socialism. I'll just quote both of them. Uh, this, this is a terrible anti-intellectual approach. He, it's not truth -seeking. I'm going to search for these names, by the way, <laughs> see if they come up. No Mundell, no Laffer, no Weninsky, Weninsky. Rothbard is in the book, but only a tiny bit. he just throws in these things. See, we have Leon Trotsky, then Aristotle, Goethe, Marx, Rothbard. And Rothbard gets this tiny little thing, and then he's just Nikolai Chernyshevsky. And then, you know, all of a sudden, now, now it's Dostoevsky. Hey, Dostoevsky actually gets attention for, like, multiple paragraphs in a row. That's unusual. Here, Sarah J. Young, the author of two scholarly books. You can see the style and the tone. Yegevni Zamyatin. Oh yeah, I tried reading this wee book. I heard it was good. And I read a bit, and it was like, it was weird, it was boring, I didn't get it. I did not get into it. 
Uh, if anyone watching this has read Wii and thinks it's actually good, uh, let me know. Maybe if you, like, summarize it a bit for me, you could convince me and I'd get into it better. But I, I tried it a little and I was just, like, not, not feeling it, not seeing the point. Wasn't interested. But if I'm missing something, if, if one of you actually liked that book, let me know. Anyway, now it's Orwell. He's just going through it. He's going to do, uh, what's his name? The Brave New World guy. Hus Husky. Something like that. Aldous Hus H Husky. How do you spell it? Al Huxley. Aldous Huxley. Hey, this guy. Watch this. He's going to be there. Yep, see? Huxley, and he even throws an anthem. This is all Huxley gets. Like, one word. But he, he wants to throw the name in. It's as many names as possible. That's the... He's trying to be very modern, like Green New Deal. He's not trying to actually teach how to think about economics. It's just how many citations can throw at people. So... Here we have... This is just the book's notes. Also the index. Okay, so only the notes in the index is um let's see how long it's up. It is twelve thousand one hundred and forty nine words. The total was ninety thousand. So that's like an eighth. More? A bit more. Anyway, how many notes are there? Does it keep counting up? No, it resets the count every chapter. But we're getting something like 15 notes per chapter. Average. Yeah, seems like around 15 notes per chapter, and this has a lot of chapters. Like 39 chapters. So that's a lot of notes. How many times does it have Ibid in it? 112 ibids. So yeah, that he just likes to cite people very quickly, as many people as possible. Like this much authority. He's just like, look how many people agree. Look how many ibids I have. Oh, a lot of this is the in index, but yeah. Like, look how many websites I've read. He's citing so much stuff that I wonder how much of it he's personally read and how much it's like an intern found it. The next thing I could do if I wanted to analyze this more, I don't know if I'm going to bother, but if you actually check random sites, some of them are going to be wrong. Some of them are going to be like egregiously wrong, like he cited it and it just doesn't say what it's supposed to say at all. I know this type of book and like how well researched they are and like when you have this many sites and it's from like this type of author who's not like a you know professional scholar. Either he fucked it up or he got, uh, you know, editors, interns, whatever, and they fucked it up. But there's going to be, like, egregious. Some of these sites are just wrong. Uh, Ann Coulter, by the way, is completely different. She was asked this, like, and she said basically, my name, my research. Um, she researches her, her own citations, and I fact-checked her, and it, it fits. The, the quality is far above the standard quality. Like, not error-free, but better than typical. But this one's going to be typical. These are not all going to be correct. Like, I would bet a lot of money on that. A lot of these are very simple. Like, it's literally just, I got this quote from this article. Oh, you, you can tell he's not going to be very good with the sites because of uh, the Riesman material that I went through earlier, where he attributed that natural impulses idea to Riesman, not in quotes, but like right before and after quotes. And that is not Riesman. So it shows that he misstates the people he's quoting. Ooh, John Stuart Mill, that sounds interesting. But then the next paragraph after that is Cortez. 
was the one before. Anyway. Oh, so this site must be for this quote, but he puts it at the end of the paragraph, not immediately after the quote. Oh, wait, this is a they wrote. So, like he's quoting someone, quoting someone else. Anyways. Right, so Cortez is trying to hijack, I'm in favor of open debate, rational discussion, let's argue our cases and trust in the merits of our argument. She's trying to hijack and, and claim that for her side. Uh, completely dishonest, but what I want to see is how does Rand Paul deal with this? Oh wait, they wrote. Is this Pine Savakis? Oh, they're just trashing Cortez. Never mind, I misunderstood it. They're saying Cortez is anti-debate. This is the kind of thing sometimes the left tries to hijack, though. Like it wouldn't be surprising if Cortez had said something like this and just accused the right of being debate. It's, it's disturbing that not two months into official government position. Was already muscularly engaging in the foremost behavior of historical socialist dictators. Seriously? Did she starve millions of people to death in a famine? The intimidation of private citizens who express viewpoints that government officials do not agree with in order to silence speech. I found it intriguing, however, that lots of people came to my course. No, you're bragging. This is such bullshit. Social posturing. Shooting his own horn. He's trying to say, oh, it's intriguing. That's why I'm telling you that I'm so great that people line up on a long waiting list to get to be near me. Anyways, not doing a good job of... um. This is not going to convince someone that the right is actually in favor of free speech or that their arguments hold up in debate. Like, it's not showing here's where all these arguments have been put forward and, and here's how they have not been answered. It's not showing the structure of the debate, the status of the debate between Mises and uh, you know other people. He hasn't gone through and like made a tree diagram of you know, here, here are all the arguments for socialism and then here are the rebuttals from Mises and other people. And then here are the rebuttals to the rebuttals, and then here are the rebuttals to the rebuttals. And you just diagram out all the arguments that have been made, and then what's the current status? What things have just never been answered? And, and take a fucking stand on that and say, here's what I think are some of the arguments that haven't been answered, uh, and here's, here's like who got the last word uh, in what debates, and so on. And, and show us that. Show us the state of the field. Uh, objectively, like, make a claim about who argued what and then who just refused to answer and you know find quotes and examples of like uh this person refused to debate or this person would not answer this argument or whatever and you know none of their followers would answer the argument and there's just no answer from their side and 
you know, point out things like Hazlitt's book on Keynes and then uh, what what literature exists from pro-Keynes people to answer Hazlitt. Make a list of it, go through, look at it, research it, and, and see what it's like and whether they actually answered Hazlitt. You could go through and you could say like, here's a, an argument from, ha from Hazlitt it's a really good one. I'm going to quote it. You know, here, here it is. Here's how great it is. And then, you know, I went through the seven books from Keynes followers that tried to answer Hazlitt, and every single one of them just literally skipped this part and didn't answer it. You know, show something like that, and that's that's how you show the other side doesn't debate. And then the current state of the debate is they just lost and haven't answered. He is not attempting to do that. He's not uh, doing rational persuasion. He doesn't know how. That's not his thing. So bad book <coughs> bad book sad story and i love Riesman. he's a great guy great arguments great books but i, I would prefer if he had not uh pandered to this and uh you know advertised and marketed the book without complaint without objection not be Promoting it as, oh, I'm so glad I was in Rand Paul's book, implying Rand Paul's above him, and he, he should be skeptical of Rand Paul, he's better than Rand Paul, he should know it, and act accordingly, and actually complain about the flaws in Rand Paul's book, point out what's not good enough about it and how we need to do better, rather than uh, just wanting... Uh, public exposure marketing by any means from anyone, regardless of the intellectual quality of what's going on. Um, he would be more thoroughly opposed to anything at all in the vicinity of the Wynand papers and, and the, the second handed popularity social status contest stuff. Having your name in print in a way that is not, you know, intellectually good is not actually helping you when you're misrepresented as believing in natural impulses that you shouldn't be all that happy about it. It's not the worst thing, like you could just ignore it, but I don't think you should be like tweeting about yay I'm in print and then get a bunch of congratulations from the Mises Scholars list with no one caring to notice what Rand Paul actually said. And that it's actually just quite contradictory to Reisman's position. All right, well, that's the end. Later, guys.